Um, so welcome everyone and um, thanks for coming along and, and spending an hour out of your day with me today. Um, hopefully we'll be inside now so you can uh, get to lunch. Um, so we're going to talk about risk assessments today and what we're really talking about is risk assessment workshops uh, and facilitating risk assessment workshops. And I know that it's just, they can be so hard, right? Um, you know, you, you're trying to get people to, to, trying to get people to attend them, trying to get operations, if you're doing it for operations, to get them to release their people. Um, and then we, they turn up and, you know, and I've done this myself in the past, the Harry um, safety person comes into the room, plugs their, plugs their laptop into the projector and puts the tool up on the screen and, you know, in the old days, um, you know, it's Excel spreadsheet. It becomes this cut and paste, <laughs> pardon me, and it's boring, <clears throat> it's repetitive. Um, everyone wants to get out of there. And really, it's just this administrative um, nonsense. And, it, and, we've, and we're not really doing anything. There's no innovation. Uh, and uh, everyone's just, you know, disengaged right uh and we repeat them it's, it's just the same after same after same so we're trying to change this because that's not what risk assessments should be so this is my top five on how to um get a better outcome from your risk assessments the first one is change the focus from restating what we know to discovering the uncertainty. And we're going to explain all of these um, in, in, in the rest of this webinar this morning. Um, so change that focus. Um, understanding risk comes from the discovery of normal work, right? So if we really want to understand risk, we have to discover what the day-to-day -day is uh, of a task, of the work, of the project. Uh, and then we're going to talk about that. Um, make sure that our risk scenarios are credible. Um, and, and where we focus there, like too often we're focusing on, on you know, the, the risk scenarios aren't credible and we spend far too long having conversations in risk assessment workshops. Um, if you were to get all your risk registers, risk assessments, and you would delete all your administrative controls, what would be left? Would there be much left? You know, tipping there wouldn't be. Um, and in reality, there's probably a fair bit we do. But in our risk assessment records, not much at all. Um, and the last tip we're going to talk about is ditch the tools for the workshop. Ditch the Excel spreadsheets. Ditch the bow ties. Ditch the software for the workshops. All right. Um, and we'll talk about that. So traditionally... A lot of our risk assessments that I've seen uh, and, and, and the people that I work with and clients, this is what the risk assessments are about. They're about justifying a decision that's already been made. Oh, we've put a piece of plant in, do a risk, you know, get the, the, get the safety advisor, do a risk assessment on that new piece of plant. Um, we've made a decision to change our org structure. Um, well, actually, we probably wouldn't even bother doing a risk assessment there. Um, you know, we've changed the way we've done that task. We've made a decision. We're going to use we're going to use an excavator instead of shovels. Uh, do a risk assessment on using the excavator, right? So we're already justifying a decision that's already been made. The problem with that, firstly, is that we've already said it's safe to do it. If we've already made a decision to do it, we've already decided that that will tolerate whatever that risk is. That's the first danger. So we'll structure our risk assessments about making sure we justify that that's a safe decision. What we really want to do and what risk assessments should be about is identifying and controlling unknown risks. That's what they should be about, the focus on the unknown. And in fact, if we go through to the risk management standard, the risk management standard quite clearly says what risk is. It's the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So it's about uncertainty. 
right? So the objective from a health and safety point of view is to complete a task. So we're sort of looking at a task risk assessment is to complete the task safely without hurting anyone. That's the objective. Where is the uncertainty? Identifying the uncertainty, managing the uncertainty. That's what we should be looking for with risk assessments. Now, I know um, we will have some overseas um, uh, viewers of, of this webinar today, and welcome. Thanks for making the effort. Um, but in Australia, um, we have a code of practice, right? How to manage work and health and safety risks released by Safe Work Australia, adopted by all the jurisdictions, and it quite clearly states of when we need to do a risk assessment. And you'll see quite there, and I've you know, been kind enough to highlight it in red, that's, you know, nice of me, I think, um, is a risk assessment should be done when there is uncertainty about how a hazard may result in an injury. Not about how that we have a hazard and we're certain about how it hurts someone's, but how if there is uncertainty about how it could hurt someone. Right? Where there is a work activity that involves a number of dis different hazards and a lack of understanding how they may interact with each other. Lack of understanding, uncertainty. Right, or changes in the workplace that may impact on the effectiveness of our controls. That's when we need to do a risk assessment. It says we may not need one in the following situations. When there's a code of practice or other guidance that sets out ways of controlling a hazard. How many codes of practice do we have? And there's some of the mandated, you know, confined spaces. Work at height, just to couple, pick a couple off the top of my head. I don't know how many times I've sat in a, a risk assessment for work at height. There's a code of practice there for it. Don't need it. Check the effectiveness of the controls and move on. That's what it says, right? If there's effective and well-known controls in an industry, again, we don't have to assess the risk. We just make sure the controls are going to be effective because that's what risk comes down to. Managing risk is about making sure we have effective controls. So the unknown, and here's some examples. So this is called a Johari window. And basically, look, it, it comes from um, psychologists, I think around the 50s. There's probably people that know a lot more about it than me, uh, Lufton and Ingham, um, and it was a method to um, help people evaluate what they think about themselves in contrast to what other people think of themselves. But it's quite a useful tool for us to have a look at and see um, what we think here. And if we have a look at this, we've got our known knowns, right? If something's known, the impact of a hazard is known, there's no uncertainty about the level of damage it could cause, technically it's not a risk, right? Technically not a risk. Um, we've then got our known unknowns, right? So our known unknowns, the risks are knowns, but the impact might not be fully measured or fully understood. That's a known, known, known unknown. Then we have our known unknowns, and these are more likely around the organisation doesn't quite understand it but someone in the organisation does. And, and that's where we want to focus those. Our last one there is our unknown unknowns. They're our black swan events, right? They're the ones that we don't know about and, and you know, it's basically ignorance. Um, and, could, and, and could we know about it? Perhaps if we went looking, um, but even then, if you don't know what you're looking for, you might not find it. So some examples of known knowns, driving, right, uh, fall from height, we know those things, right? Um, we know that there's a certainty about the level of risk for someone falling from height, you know, anywhere from a first aid injury up to a fatality. We know that, right? We know that. Um, hazardous manual tasks or known unknowns. We know we have hazardous manual tasks in our organisations. We know that there's, you know, people are lifting things, moving things, you know, repetitive strain, whatever it may be. 
but we might not understand the impact. And one of the reasons we don't understand the impact, we're not certain about that, is because, you know, we're talking about chronic and long, you know, could take, you know, years for someone to, 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 to show the effects and for those effects and the consequences to come through. Unknown, un, unknown, known. So these are the things that exist in our business that we don't. Now, the example of here has got a combination of hazards because I'm leveraging off the code of practice there. Um, where, where multiple hazards intersect. So work at hot, hot work, you know, one of the things could happen, you know, potentially is what, well, you know, we could be welding or grinding and the sparks could affect our uh, working at hot equipment, our safety harness, for example. But also what the unknown nodes is about is about that, um, is about things that happen in our business that we don't know about. So these are the workarounds that our, workers do to get stuff done that isn't in the procedure isn't in any risk assessment um is not really ever seen by management because it's done in the field or you know under you know or, or even the supervisor know, might know about it but it's not ever fed up because they're just getting the job done right and and lastly an example and, I'm, and obviously i have to change this at some stage and, and come up with something else but in the past, we would have said COVID-19 for a massive amount of organisations was an unknown unknown. Um, now, uh, a, an epidemic, a worldwide epidemic or pandemic, pandemic, pandemic would, would obviously be a known unknown. So we know it's a risk. We have no idea about the impacts. Um, or it might be, in, in that case, um, it'll be interesting to see if you've got pandemic in risk register because you can't have as a. So how are you controlling the next pandemic? Anyway, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. So these are our known unknowns. These are looking at those. Now, what I want to do, I want to focus on hazards and manual tasks. I want to focus, sorry, on these two. Our known unknowns and our unknown knowns. That's the focus for me because that's where the uncertainty lies. So this is the first step in improving your risk assessments is focusing on the unknowns, the uncertainty. And the thing about that, it's more engaging for the people that turn up because you're not just repeating the same old stuff all the time. You're looking for differences. You're looking for differences. So get off the risk assessment merry-go-round. Stop reassessing the same risks. We're just wasting everyone's time and it's actually hurting us as a profession. The alternative, work simulation. So rather than call something a risk assessment, I invite people to come to a workshop where we run through the task, run through the project, run through the work, and we basically use it as a planning tool. Now, the good thing about that is anyone involved in the work is probably going to want to attend because it's going to affect directly how they do it. So that's that's the important thing. And it's a step-by-step. -step. And the thing is, it separates the knowns from the unknowns. It, and if we discover uncertainty, then we can go and risk assess that and we can work on that. So I hope, hopefully that. So that's point one. Focus on the unknowns. Focus on the uncertainty. Stop repeating those risk assessments where you just, you know, the same old thing time after time after time. There's no value in that. Step, my top, second top tip, context matters. So context is everything that surrounds the task. So not just the content of the task, so the step-by-step, -step, but the context, the work environment, the physical environment, the emotional, the equipment, the tools, the resourcing, the relationships between uh, employees, contractors, workers, uh, management, planning, scheduling, job demands, all these things are context. And it's within context and the exploration of the context of the work will find the risk. So for those of you that are familiar with Todd Conklin's work, we're talking about the blue line. Work is done, as Todd calls it, or I call it work is normal, how it's done every day. You know, so the production pressure, and there's always production pressure, it's not perceived, it's just it exists. It either impacts how the work's done or it doesn't. 
if it impacts how the work's done, it's a risk, right? Now it could be, and remember, risk can be good or bad. Risks are not always, it could be a threat or an opportunity, right? Risk is both. So it's that, it's those local factors. And yeah, there's many on to, there's many people on today's call who you know have have don't just have one single site that they look after. They have multiple sites in vast diverse locations with diverse workforces. And it's the local factors. You know, um, English is a second language in some of it, some of the work that we do. Some you know very poor literacy skills in some of the work that we do. You know, that's a risk if we're trying to communicate how we want work done, right? How they adapt, where they have to change, where, you know, COVID changed things. Um, you know, communication processes, trade-offs, you know, if we've got, and, and contractors, client relationships, risks within those, you know, um, maintenance versus operations, preventative maintenance versus operations. You know, the more we maintain the, the gear, the less likely it's to break down, but the trade-off is it's not running as much, so we're not making any production out of it. The less we trade it, the more it works, the more money we make out of it, but it's more likely to break down, leading perhaps to less, to more downtime and less money. So there's always these trade-offs, goal conflicts between contractors and clients. Now, clients' con uh, goal is to get the work done for as cheap as possible, uh, but the best possible cheap, if that makes sense. And I'm being you know, a little bit facetious there, obviously. Um, the contractor's job is to actually get the job done and make the most amount of money for the least amount of costs. So they have the biggest margin. That's their conflict. That's their goal. Two diametrically opposed goals, um, both driven by finance, right? Surprises, you know, resourcing. We see in the construction industry, it's a mixture between labour shortages and, and material shortages. All these affect how the work's done. That's where our risks lie and how they're impacted and how workers deal with those risks, how they deal with those, that context of the work. So learning about this in any risk assessment workshop is vital. Right? And how do we learn about it? Go out into the field, right? Go and look, see how the work's done. Talk with people, talk with who, people who do the job. Don't just talk to people who supervise the work because all you're going to learn is their context. You need to learn the context of the people who do the work, all right? Now, best case in the field, worst case in an office, or well, not worst case, but next best case in an office. Right in a, in, a, in, a, in a suitable room. Must be the people who do the work. Apparently do the work. I would love as a profession if we would draw, draw a line in the sand and we make a decision never ever again to do another risk assessment workshop and gather that information without the people who do the work. I've lost count of the amount of times and I've seen it, I'm still seeing it, where... Uh, uh, executive or a leader will ask someone to do a risk assessment and then not release their people and expect the safety person to sit at their desk and get the last risk assessment, copy and paste it, make some changes, or just do one from scratch, just sitting at their desk. And maybe have a couple of conversations with some supervisor. I can just put it bluntly, right? It's unethical, it's unprofessional, and... I would argue you're leaving yourself open um, at some stage if things go horrendously wrong to action by the regulator. So, you know, we've got to get those people in. Brainstorming sessions. And we're going to talk about that because that's that's all I run. That's how I get, that's where I get my information. That's where I get part of my information, right? Uh, and one of the other ways we can do, so brainstorming by itself, just normal, or a version of brainstorming called learning teams, which are very successful at learning and understanding, um, uncovering this risk. And the good thing about learning teams, they don't just discover safety risk. In fact, they're not about safety, they're about the work. They will discover your safety risk or health risk or whatever risk. They'll discover your quality risk. They'll discover your production risk, efficiency risk. They'll discover all those issues. So they're very, very clever. But it comes down to this. Um, 
Now, there'll be some of you who get this slide, some of you who don't. For those that don't, that's Ted Lasso. Uh, Lasso or Lasso. Uh, it's got a, got a series on Netflix, very funny. Um, but basically, it's about being curious, about asking the right questions to the right people. Now, it can be in a group setting, it can be one-on-one, -on -one, it doesn't matter. It's asking the right questions and coming from a position of not being judgmental. Now, there's a lot of safety people that have transitioned from operational roles into safety. You have to get rid of your operational head when you're being curious. You have to get, and by that, I mean, you have to get rid of what you would think you would do, what you think the risk is, because that's bias, bias, right? What we want is what they want, what they think, what they know in these workshops. And, and so we can't be judgmental and we have to be curious. So some of the questions I ask are things like, what's out of your control when you do this task? And then tell me a story. What, when's the last time that happened? How did you handle it? Right. When do you have to adapt? Like, so you, you know, you'll go out there, you've got a plan. What happens when you have, how do you have to, why do you have to adapt? How? How do you deal with that? Do you do it on the fly? You know? And more often than not, when they have to adapt, they do it on the fly. They, you know, there's this mistaken belief that every single person is hardwired to stop the work when something changes. It's the complete opposite. Like that is one of the worst myths going around in safety. You know, you can put that right up there with zero harm, that people will automatically stop the work. They don't. People are engineers at heart, um, and I mean that in a good way. They want to get the work done. They get paid to get the work done. They will find a way to make it happen. Uh, expecting them to go against human nature, we're going to be disappointed a lot of the time, right? So how do they have to adapt? What's out of your control? Those are the sort of questions I ask and ask them to give examples. That's when we're getting context. That's when we're getting context. That's when we're going to find out what's really going on, all right? What's really going on? And I've said it again, I, won't, I, I cannot reiterate this more than I possibly can. If you don't have the right people, don't do the risk assessment. You're just putting your own professionalism at risk. And all you're going to do is deliver a substandard product, substandard product. And I've done it, I've done it, but I'm not doing it anymore. I don't have the right people in the room, I don't run it. I just cancel it. That was tip two. Tip three, credible, Worst case scenarios, right? So that's that's that principle about fun, uh, how we measure risk because risk is you know risk is scalable, right? Um, you know someone who's who you know driving a vehicle in a car park at five kilometres an hour is a much different perspective to driving a risk on a dark uh, country road at night in the rain. So what we talk about in here is credible worst case scenario. They must be plausible, must be credible, must be reasonable. So this is my tip. So every single one must be credible, right? And so what I do with that is I provide an example of what credible is. So if I'm walking through a car park and I trip over my own two big fat feet, you know, which I've done, the most likely injury for me is some scrapes on my hands, possibly my elbows maybe my knees, um, probably the biggest damage is to my ego as I'm looking around to see if there's any cameras so I can go delete CCTV footage. Not that I do that. Um, that's the most likely injury. That's the most credible likely injury. Could I die? Well, it's possible. And the reason it's possible is because anything's possible. It's one of my pet hates on risk matrices that have possible in their descriptors, right? For likelihood because anything's possible, right? But for me to die from tripping over my feet in the car park, we'd have to add to the risk. We'd have to put like me hitting my head. We'd have to put like me um, and getting a brain injury. And we'd have to put me maybe getting knocked out and falling into a puddle of water and drowning or being, you know, falling over and, you know, and, and getting run over by a vehicle. They're all different risks to me just tripping over my feet. So it's credible. It's got to be credible. And we'll talk about this in a minute. It's also got to be a credible consequence. 
of what happened. So the whole scenario has to be credible. So I encourage you when you when when you're talking to people and coming up with risk scenarios of what's credible, what could go wrong, give them that example. If not, come up with another example that they'll understand that's relevant to you. That's the one I use. Um, risk scenarios. Right. Real quick, screenshot it if you have to. Um, this is how I write a risk scenario. It's quite simple. Um, I'm not going to, you know, there's a room full of professionals here. I'm not going to explain what each of these is. Hazard, interaction, target, and the consequence. Right. So this is how I write a risk scenario. Not how I assess risk. This is how I write a risk scenario. So it's the hazard and it's the interaction between the hazard and the target and it's the credible consequence, right, of that interaction, the credible worst case scenario, the credible worst case consequence. And that is how I write a risk scenario. If it doesn't have those four things, it's not a risk. If there's no consequence, there's no risk. One of the interesting things I see is risk matrices with nil consequence. If there's no consequence, no potential consequence, there can be no risk, right? There can be no risk if there's no credible potential consequence. So have a look at your risk matrices and if they've got, you know, down the very far left or right or wherever you have it, minor, nil consequence, have a think about that because that means there's no risk. So why are you even assessing it at all? What a waste of time, right? So a tip within a tip, when you're deciding on your consequences, get them from get them from your risk descriptors. So here's an example of, uh, of the one sort of we use, and you'll see there, you know, first aid injury, right? Um, or restricted work injury. So they're quite... You know, that, that's the, the consequences as defined in the risk matrix descriptors. Use that. Use that in your risk consequence. Don't use, um, you know, my example before, I could fall over. Probably the most credible work, by the way, I should have mentioned that. The most credible injury, worst case injury, is probably a broken bone, right? Broken wrist, collarbone. Um, so that would either be restricted or work loss time injury for me. So that is the credible worst case consequence is a restricted work injury or lost time injury. And that's how I write it, right? So don't put a specific injury. Don't put laceration. Don't put, you know, unconsciousness. Don't put anything like that. Don't put heat stroke. Use the consequence in your descriptors. The good thing about that is when, it go, when you go to assess the risk in your matrices, which I'll have another thing to say about a little bit later, um, you've already defined it. You've already that's already been discussed, determined, we're done. So use that. And it doesn't matter if it's you know damage to equipment or reputation or environment, whatever, use those descriptors. So look, here's an example. Um, you know, here's an example. Target, pedestrian, interaction, they're crossing, uh, hazard, busy road, consequence of fatality. We put it all together, you know, pedestrian crossing a busy road and being hit by a vehicle resulting in a fatality. So you, that's a risk scenario. So every risk scenario should, you should see should have those four ingredients. If they don't have those four ingredients, then what we're, it's not a risk. It, it always must be a target and it can be reputation, it can be um, compliance, it can be environment, it can be safety. Can be equipment, whatever your whatever it is, um, must have a hazard, and it must have an interaction, and obviously there must be a consequence. Now it's just wordsmithing, right? So you can write it up however you want. And look, there might you know some people might disagree between my hazard and my interaction. There might be a little bit of mixture there. That's okay. You should still be able to find those four ingredients. And it doesn't matter if it's a complex one or not. So it doesn't matter if it's a bow tie. And, and I mean, Marsha's my, my got a bow tie um, in, in its system. Uh, it, it could be that. 
it could be an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it could be anything. If you cannot find those four ingredients, there's no risk, right? There's no risk. Um, so credible risk scenarios, they must have all those four um, and we must, and, and that's where we must end up. So hopefully that makes sense. So that was, I think, tip three. We're going well today. Excellent. Controls. So one of the things I do is at a workshop, so I'll, if you're sitting in the workshop with me, I run through the context of work and that gives me the risks. I then identify what critical consequence those risks could have. And that's basically my risk scenario is done, right? Then I go over to my controls. And when I'm looking at my controls, I look at to make sure the controls are specific to the risk. So in other words, I don't allow generic controls in my workshops. And I'll actually tell them at the start. So when I'm going into the to this scenario, so I don't do controls until I've done all the risks. Once I've done all the risks, well, then we'll go to controls because if we start fixing things before we've identified all the issues, we stop looking for the issues, right? So or, or this is how I structure my workshops. And I tell them, we're going to look at controls now. And I don't want to hear about training. I don't want to hear about supervision. I don't want to hear about pre-task risk assessments like take fives or slams or whatever um, misguided tools being used there. I don't want to hear about those. All I want to hear about is what's specific for the risk. And when we get to that, right, I want to hear the specific bit of that. So I don't want a generic PPE, right? If we need specific PPE, and the example there I've given is Riggers, Riggers Clubs meeting the Australian standard, but it could be work at height harness. So, the, so instead of work at height PPE or harness, I would have, I want a work at height harness that meets Australian standard, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, whatever that number is, and there'll be some of you on today that know that number, and uh, I don't. Um, I don't want just inspections. I want what specifically are you inspecting? Right? I don't want just maintenance or preventative maintenance. I want how often is that maintenance going to occur? Because maintenance should know how often the maintenance needs to occur from the risk assessment, not the other way around. Too often the tail wags the dog. The risk assessment is the source control, is where we source our controls that then go into our systems procedures, right? It shouldn't be the other way around. We shouldn't be sourcing controls from our systems and procedures. They should be sourced from risk assessments, right? I don't want to see just bundling or barricading. What do you mean? Specifically, what are we talking about? Right? And this is what we're talking about. So be very clear. So when you're in your workshops, do that. And in your tool, right, be it whether the Marsh risk assessment modules or Excel or Bowtie or whatever you use, put a disclaimer. Put a statement in that says we, we, we just ignore those for the purpose of these systems. If they exist, right, for the, for the purpose of this risk assessment workshop, we're, we're saying, yeah, we've got them in place for all of our risks. Right, so you're just covering yourself off there. Right, just covering yourself off there. And then when we do that, it gives us space in a risk assessment workshop to push the team to think outside the box, to think about what else could we do? Right? Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create as big as gap as we can between how we normally do the work and the risk. We're trying to drive as much distance as we can because there's always going to be drift, right? It's very hard to prevent drift. So we're always going to, we, we need to drive this distance as much as we can, you know, and we, and, and we have to look at the hierarchy of controls. Right, we have to look at the hierarchy of controls. And I was, I was um, at a at a, a few months ago. I 
I went to a little workshop, a uh, little um, that um, someone ran, and there was a Q, uh, UQ professor there, and he said, actually, the hierarchy of controls actually only has three controls in the hierarchy of controls for an organisation. Elimination, substitution, engineering, slash isolation. That's it. Because when we go below that to administration and PPE, as an organisation, we're saying, well, we've done our bit. That's all we can do. Now it's up to you. Now it's up to you. We can't do anything more. Now it's over to you to control. And I found that really interesting. When I go through any of my risk assessments, I go through the hierarchy control with the risk assessment workshop. And I consider each risk. And remember, the opportunity you have now is you've got four ingredients for each risk. If you And you can apply controls to each of those ingredients. If I can control, if I can eliminate the hazard, I've eliminated the risk, right? If I can engineer the hazard, engineer the interaction, engineer the, put an engineering barrier between the hazard and the, and the, and the uh, target, I can control the risk, right? If we can do something to the consequence, potentially we're, they're a mitigating control, right? So that we'll talk about those. But I put it through the hierarchy specifically and I challenge it. Why can't we eliminate part of that? Why can't we, particularly this space, why can't we engineer or isolate? What's your problem? Why can't we do it? And I don't accept this is how we've always done it. That's a cop-out. Absolute cop-out for me. We don't do that. So question the controls, right? As I said before, if you got rid of all the admin controls, what would you have left? Um, look, if they're a critical risk, then they should, and they're a critical control for that risk. Uh, work at heights is an example of one. Um, yes, we've got that in place. We've got, say, work at height equipment. Right. Well, have we, have we clearly defined its performance objectives? Right. And are we verifying those controls are in place? Um, the International Council on Mining and Minerals. Um, or mining and metals. I can never remember if it's mining and metals or mining and minerals anyway. One of those two. ICMM, look them up. They've got critical um, control management guides, guidebooks. They're free. Go and download them and they will provide some really good ideas for you about um, how you can design critical controls. So controls should be designed and very critical controls should be designed they should have performance objectives and they should have a verification program. Um, and um, I know Marsh has a very good critical control module uh, program that does just that and integrates with your other systems. If you're, if you're with Marsh, ask them about it. Uh, it works quite well. If not, if you're not with Marsh, um, then you can do it manually um, uh, and reach out. And uh, if you want any more information, we can give you a heads up on that. Too often, we do a risk assessment and all we have is a con for our future actions, which we don't already have in place. And then we wonder why they get knocked back. Wonder why they get knocked back. Um, my advice to everyone is if it's that good, then demonstrate it's that good. Show that you can make a business show that you can, that there's an actual reduction. One of the ways to do that, and we don't have time today because I could actually literally spend four hours going through, um, going through this, is utilising uh, as a cost-benefit analysis using um, the, 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 the value of statistical life, right? So this is the dollar man, uh, value uh, of enterprise risk that an organisation puts on a, on a fatality. Um, in Australia, on average, last year or the year before, it was 5.1 million per, per person. And so that's a statistical value. It's based on a whole heap of factors over 40 years of life working and all sorts of things. Um, and we can demonstrate that the change in likelihood with the life of the controls over that, uh, you know, number of fatalities, um, the cost of the control, and, and we can work through those things. So... My advice to you is if you've got a, a big ticket item that you need to get over the space, um, as a my role as a facilitator is to help build that business case to demonstrate there is definite value there. So we don't do it in this one, um, but at some stage I'll talk to Sarah. We might run another 
um, workshop at some stage and webinar and, and Sarah's probably going yay um, on actually what so far as reasonably practical means because a lot of um, a lot of uh, safety people uh, and professionals don't have an actual proper uh, understanding because it, it is definable uh, and, in, and including that is that definition of grossly disproportionate understanding that um, so there's some real legal and actual um, methodical ways we can work that out and, and, and we can we can show like business case cost of the control is going to be two million if you don't do it there's a risk of 15 million up to you right and we can show that risk tolerability um last tip ditch the tools for the workshop there's nothing more boring than walking into a room um, and having excel spreadsheets and bow ties and other software up on projector on the screen and everyone uh, looking at those things, it's it's it drives me nuts. Uh, it turns into spell check, grammar grammar check, um, copy and paste, and all that sort of stuff. Get rid of them. Workshops are for gathering information, not recording information. Like not for analysing information and putting it into somewhere. Just I get people. I use a couple of whiteboards, and I sit in a room uh, with them and go through it. I use brainstorming, right. Um, it helps focus people, gives everyone a voice, and you can identify your hazards and risk, and you can identify your controls in those things. Really easy way to do it. Really easy way to do it. Um, use a scribe, whiteboards, flip charts, post notes, take photos, and then at the end of it, start populating your tool. Because remember, at the end of the day, um, the the um, workshop is just one place you're gathering information. The other places you're gathering information to assess risk is from your incident management databases, right? Is from Safe Work Australia statistics, is from industry statistics, is from um, regulators and, 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 and notes from regulators and, and, and all those sort of things. The workshops are just one part of the gathering. It's just one tool we use. It shouldn't be your only tool, right? It shouldn't be your only tool, which is the main, which is one of the second, is the second reason I don't put the tool in the workshop because there's other information that those people in the workshop don't have access to. So do that. Now, here's a freebie. I said top five. I'm going to give you six. Um, the worst thing to ever happen to safety is this stupid thing. Um, and I, look, I'm sorry if I offend anyone uh, by calling it that. Risk matrices are a massive waste of time, um, especially this five by five thing. It's they're completely subjective. And look, I'm pretty sure, you know, with this audience, I'm probably talking to the converted. Don't use them in your workshops. It's as simple as that. Do not use them in your workshops. Um, simply do that bit outside the workshop. If you have to use and pump it in and get your little rating, then do it outside of the workshop itself. Uh, I'm sure just about everyone on this call today would have had an experience sitting in a workshop and arguing about it's rare, it's unlikely, it's possible, it's rare. No, I think it's rare. I think it's unlikely. Oh my god, um, I there's not I, I I can't get that time back in my life, and I'm pretty sure I wasted way too much of it facilitating those discussions. So don't facilitate them. Take it out. Don't need it. At the end of the day, if you have to put that into your system and give it some value, uh, some sort of sort, sort of um, subjective value, then do it yourself afterwards. You'll get a more consistent approach. Um, and um, it's all, you already know it's credible. So the likelihood it will fall, and chances are with controls, if it falls out of rare and unlikely, it's almost a unicorn because that's where 99% of them fall. Uh, and then when you have a look at the risk matrix like that one, there's probably only if it's a serious injury, there's any difference in how you treat it. Or what the risk tolerability is, the risk tolerability is going to be the same. So, yeah, um, that's that's my advice. So that's how I threw that in, threw that in at the end. So it well, wasn't said top five, but we gave you a six. Um, end of the day, add value. Be more interested in what's happening, not what's happening with the paperwork. Um, that's more interesting to me. That's me. Um, that's a link to our website there. Uh, feel free to, um, at any stage, to... Uh, reach out and um, yeah, if you've got any questions or want to know any more or see what we're about yet, yeah, uh, go to the website and have a look, uh, but thank you.
Thank you, Mark. Um, there is a link there to your website in the chat. There's also a link to all your webinars that you have done on the HCQ Academy, and they are great. And um, a link to a um, the information about the Myos Critical Control Management Module. There's a question here from Kimberly. What is the name of the program you mentioned in the critical control slide? Um, that would be um, so. Um, there's two things there. One is um, uh, it's the International Council of Mining and Metals, I think, or Mining and Minerals. It's one or the other. ICMM, they have a critical control management guidelines. Um, so I think that might be what you're mentioning. Um, so you can go find it, just Google them and you'll find it at their website. Um, and I, I also mentioned that Myosh has a critical control module as part of their Viking package. So Stephen asks, if we find ourselves in a position where we are asked to provide an, a risk assessment for something already purchased, what's one thing we can do to move the conversation to a better place? Um, so the first conversation I would have is with the decision maker about how about we do a risk assessment before we buy the piece of machinery. Um, that, would, that would be that. And then I would have a change management conversation and assess the risks of moving from the old machinery to the new machinery. So yes, you will do a plant hazard ID checklist on that new machinery, looking for guarding and all that sort of stuff. The real risk is that the uncertainty lies about how we're going to go um, with our people moving from the old piece of equipment to the new piece of equipment uh, and, and, and how we're going to manage those risks. So lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, those sort of things, how are we managing that? That's the second conversation I would have, and that's what I would run my risk assessment on. Not on particularly the new piece, but transferring people from the old one to the new one and how are we going to manage that? Okay, thank you. Um, so Stephen just asked, sorry, Hamilton just asked, is it going to be shared? It will be shared by email later today. Um, it is actually on the homepage of the Academy already because some work has been happening behind the scenes, but the video is not the correct video. So check in about a couple of hours. And um, I think Gavin, thank you, has found the ICMM link and put that in the chat as well. So. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So that HSEQ Academy homepage has all the upcoming webinars and um, any recent webinars um, yeah. happening. Just a couple of points in the chat there, Sarah. I just I, I just saw um, psychosocial safety hazards. Um, people um, people at work.gov.au. If you want to manage psychosocial safety hazards, start there. Um, they can't be treated like you can't do a risk assessment for psychosocial safety hazards like you do for. Uh, standard uh, work health and safety hazards. Don't even try. Um, there's a whole bunch of work around that. And I would go through uh, people at work.gov.au and it's endorsed by the regulator. So why wouldn't you? Um, and I think there was one other thing. Uh, virtual facilitating virtual workshop. Test your IT. So Sarah and I were on 15 minutes before today. We made sure the, the links work. We made sure my presentation work, we made sure um, we could hear each other, um, do that. Um, I have a rule for facilitating um, virtual workshops. Everyone has to have their own camera and own microphone. Uh, I don't do facilitating group workshops uh, where people in one room all together because um, the, the lack of, there's a lack of control there. So everyone has to have that. Um, so that's it. Great. Thank you for joining us, Mark. I know you've got to rush off now and there's a lot of good com comments there. Um, hopefully we'll see you again in um, a couple of weeks few or a few months. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye.